Good morning. Welcome to Law Power Hour. For those of you who want something to do this morning, it's really important. It's Men's Health Day down at Ford Field. You can get your blood pressure checked, your cholesterol checked, your heart checked, your whole body checked out, eyes for free. Men's Health Day, Ford Field. Be going on all day. So you ought to get down there, get checked out. The cars were backed up all the way out through the street. Hopefully, there'll be more than 5,000 people that attend down there. It's a good day just to get your maintenance done with the fall just beginning. Good things are happening in Michigan. We've got an election coming up in November. We all have to get out and vote because we have to make some changes on our laws. But good things are happening today. As of October 1st, the financial responsibility fee is being waived. So that means if you are under the law and have a financial responsibility fee, you no longer have that as of October 1st. If you go down to the Secretary of State, you can get your license back. And you don't have to pay a reinstatement fee. That means that the state of Michigan is giving up $350 million in fees to get your folks back on the road. Now, how do financial responsibility fees occur? Well, your license gets suspended because you haven't paid your tickets. You can get your license back, but you also have to take care of your tickets, which is a separate issue. That question came up uh, yesterday when uh, I was in a clinic over at Dr. Holly's church he had a workforce development day and we had a law clinic over there we're going to talk about that this morning but the issue came up gentleman said to me i've got some outstanding tickets can i go down and get my license on monday at the secretary of state reinstated i said yes you can but you also have to go take care of your tickets because if you don't make a deal to take care of your tickets, you're not going to get reinstated. So, yes, you can get reinstated if you have a suspended license. And people get their license suspended because they have no proof of insurance. They get their license suspended for a number of different reasons. Because they were driving on a suspended license. Because they were involved in an accident and they drove while their license was suspended, causing a serious injury, or their vehicle was immobilized, or they had no proof of insurance. Now you can go down to the Secretary of State and get your license reinstated. The only hitch, the only hitch is the following. If your license has been suspended, for an offense other than driver's responsibility fees, such as failure to appear in court or driving on a suspended license, you have to resolve those issues. Now, if your license is suspended because you haven't paid your tickets, you can go down to the 36th District Court in Detroit or any other district court and enter into a payment plan. Don't be afraid to go down there. Nobody's going to arrest you if you voluntarily show up there, they may put you on bond, but they're not going to arrest you. Now, the effect of not paying a ticket can cause you not only to lose your driver's license, but it can affect you in many other ways. Because if you get picked up driving on a suspended license, then it just enhances your inability to get back on the road. Now, if you haven't paid your fees to the friend of the court, you haven't paid your friend of the court obligations, your license can be suspended. If you haven't paid your state income tax, your license can be suspended. But in both instances, paying your taxes or paying the friend of the court, you can enter into payment agreements to get back on the road. So you can get the driver's responsibility fees waived as of October 1st. Don't be discouraged. Go down there, pack a lunch if you have to, if there are long lines, and wait. There'll be no new fees assessed at that time, October 1st, 
through the end of the year is the time to go down and there's no reinstatement fee. If you have any additional questions, contact the Secretary of State. Here's their number, 888-767-6424. I know I don't have any guests today because these are important issues and I'm going to repeat them. I want you to call in and ask me questions about this or anything else that's on your mind this morning because this interaction seems to help sometimes with the show. So remember, Secretary of State, October 1st, it's Monday. To the end of the year, you can go down and get your license reinstated. Now, if you've lost your license because of financial responsibility, that means you've got a judgment against you because you were involved in an accident and you were uninsured. The financial responsibility requirements are different than the driver responsibility fees. You can drive if you have a financial responsibility judgment against you, but you must purchase financial responsibility insurance, which leads me to the next issue. Do I have to have insurance in order to drive in the state of Michigan? The answer to the question is yes. Driving an uninsured vehicle in the state of Michigan gives rise, if you're involved in an accident, to a citation. And that citation can create a financial responsibility issue other than a driver's responsibility fee. If you have an accident and you are insured, make sure that your insurance meets the following requirements. That you're insured at the residence where you live, not where you stay. Don't use somebody else's address. Do not use somebody else's address to get cheaper insurance and claim that you stay there if you don't live there. I've had this issue come up five times in my office in the last month. And it's made individuals who've been involved in accidents, who were driving cars, who thought they were insured, who used another relative's address to get cheaper insurance, ineligible, ineligible to receive any benefits under Michigan law. So the reason that you remain ineligible to get benefits is the following. Because you falsified your application for insurance. If you falsify your application for insurance, the insurance company does not have to provide you with automobile insurance coverage. So beware. You must be insured at the residence that's on your driver's license, or if you're moving, change your address and notify your insurance company of the change of your address immediately. Otherwise, you're going to create a conflict. Let me give you a simple example. You get involved in an accident today. You've been living at a new address for the last two months. You go down to the Secretary of State on Monday and change your address. It might be too late. So don't be lazy. Just be responsible. Change your address as soon as you move to avoid a conflict with your insurance company and notify Notify your insurance company that you've changed your address. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble if you get in an accident. This is a requirement under the Michigan law for your protection. Insurance companies are ruthless. Insurance companies will willy weasel and find any way available to wiggle out of paying you benefits if you're entitled to receive them. So don't put down a different address than where you live and the address that appear, appears on your driver's license when you apply for insurance. I'll be back in a couple minutes. I'm going to take a break for a minute and then we'll talk a little bit more about this insurance issue and the difference between reinstatement fees and driver's fees.
Are you in legal trouble? Are you in need of legal advice or just have general legal questions? Call 1-800-529-8721. That's 1-800-LAW-USA-1. And watch Law Power Hour and get your questions answered by experienced attorneys who are experts in their field. That's Law Power Hour, hosted by Barry Keller, attorney at law. Saturdays at 10 a.m. here on WHPR Detroit Live. You know, the reason I'm so insistent this morning, I didn't have a guest, is because uh, driving's a privilege. And getting your license back if it's suspended or revoked is very important because it's a barrier to going to work. Yesterday when I was over at Dr. Holly's at his workforce uh, program trying to get jobs for people, one of the biggest issues is how do we help people get back their driver's license so they can go to work? There's a lot of jobs out there. There's a lot of opportunity. The skilled trades. I talked to steel workers yesterday. I talked to uh, the uh, plumbers union. I talked to the electrical union. Everybody has to have a license in these trades to go to work. But the barriers are there, and we create our own barriers and obstacles, and we should get rid of them. There are three main barriers to going back to work. One of them is getting your driver's license back. The second one that we have to worry about yeah, my shaky finger up went up there. It was the second one that we have to worry about is expungement, getting our record clear, are doing the best we can. As you know, the governor just recently passed a law that we don't have to check the box that we have a felony when we apply for a job on an application for employment. But some jobs require that employers look behind the box to find out about individuals because there are security clearances that are necessary for jobs. So that's the second barrier. The third barrier is having outstanding obligations with the friend of the court, and the fourth barrier is an income tax lien. Now we can remove all of these barriers or at least make an effort to adjust those if we want to be in the world of working individuals, if we want to benefit from higher wages that are available in the state of Michigan, jobs that are available in the city of Detroit, and an opportunity to turn our lives around. It's in our hands. It's our responsibility. And on Law Power Hour, we're here to give you information. If you have questions about this, you can call me at my office at 248-335-9266. We'll pick up the phone, we'll answer your questions, and we'll explain to you what you have to do. That's why I bring these things up on the air sometimes. I come on by myself because I want you folks to know that we want you to get back to work. We want you to get on your feet. We want you to get jobs, support your families, get new cars, do the things you want to do with your life. But you can't do them unless you remove the barriers. We'll assist you in removing the barriers. And to that extent, I want to move on and talk about expungement. Yesterday, there were 14 people who showed up at the Workforce Development Job Fair at Dr. Holly's. 14 people came to see us about expungement. The first question that was asked, can I get an expungement if I have committed a crime that is not covered under the laws of the state of Michigan if it's a federal crime, like a bank robber was there. He committed a bank robbery 31 years ago. The only way that you can get an expungement for a federal crime is to get a pardon from the United States government. And that's from the President of the United States. And you can file for a pardon. You can petition for a pardon and go through your congressional office to get a pardon because people are being denied jobs because they've committed crimes. Well, we shouldn't have barriers to employment. We shouldn't have barriers that prevent people from voting. We should have these barriers removed so you can get back on your feet. And speaking of barriers, convicted felons who return home from prison, convicted felons who return home from prison 
are eligible to vote in the state of Michigan and don't forget to vote in the November election because every vote counts. It's important for you to be out there and vote. So the next question is, am I eligible for expungement? In other words, can I get my record cleared in the state of Michigan if I've committed a crime? The answer to the question is yes, under certain circumstances. If you committed a felony, one felony and two misdemeanors, you can get your record expunged, and that's the maximum. A lady came to see me yesterday who had three misdemeanors. And it was very interesting. They, she said, I went to court for all three misdemeanors on the same day, but it was really tricky. Each misdemeanor had a separate case number. And because each misdemeanor had a separate case number and she pled guilty to all three misdemeanors, she couldn't get an expungement. And it took me about 20 minutes to explain to her, and it wasn't her fault, why she couldn't get an expungement. Three misdemeanors with three different court case numbers are independent, individual, identifiable cases. Independent, individual, identifiable, identifiable cases. So it led me to the following Conclusion, I think individuals, before they take pleas, should consult, should consult a lawyer to determine the consequences of that plea. For example, if you already have two misdemeanors, instead of taking a plea to the third misdemeanor, you should consult a lawyer and find out if that's going to prevent you, if that's going to prevent you from getting an expungement. If you have one felony and you have no misdemeanors and it's not a high crime and there's a chance of breaking it down to a misdemeanor, you should consult a lawyer before you voluntarily enter into a plea so that you have an opportunity to get an expungement. Now, expungements are kind of tricky. Because you got to wait five years. I have people coming in who pled guilty in 2014. They have to wait till 2019 to apply for an expungement. And what happens if you get an expungement? It cleans your record. Certain crimes are not eligible for expungement. For example, crimes involving domestic violence are not eligible for expungement. Crimes involving traffic offenses and serious injuries in traffic offenses are not expungible. Another example of non-expungible crimes are crimes involving uh, pornography, children's injuries, rape, first, second degree, fourth degree criminal sexual misconduct because they're not acceptable for expungement. Now, if two minors are charged under the law we call Romeo and Juliet law, they may be expunged. So what's the process for expungement? Step one in the expungement process, and if you're out there, listen up because it's important for you to know how to do this, or call my office at 248 three three five nine two six six and we'll send you a booklet that we've prepared called can I clear my criminal record and there's a number of questions that you're going to be asked and if you can answer those questions you can get an expungement here's the set of questions that I want you all to listen to do I have a criminal conviction from a federal court if the answer is yes no, you cannot get an expungement. Do you have a criminal conviction in another state? If the answer is yes, you have to go to the other state. And we've handled them for people in Kentucky and Nevada, Arizona, California, to get them expungements. There are a few states in the union where they do not have expungement laws. They only have pardon laws. 
So you have to consult a lawyer, and we'll give you that information. Just give us a call at 248-335-9266. There'll be no charge for answering that question. Do I have two or more adult felonies? If the answer to that is yes, no, you cannot get an expungement. Do you have a conviction involving criminal sexual conduct, first, second, or third degree, or an assault with intent to commit criminal sexual conduct? If the answer is yes, no, you cannot get an expungement. Is the conviction you want to set aside a misdemeanor? If the answer to that question is yes, you can still get an expungement unless it involves a traffic offense with the Michigan Vehicle Code. So it's important. It's important to consult a lawyer if you plead guilty to a misdemeanor involving a traffic offense to make sure that it does not involve a traffic offense under the Michigan Vehicle Code if you want to get an expungement. Has it been less than five years? Has it been less than five years since my conviction? If it's less than five years, you're not eligible for the expungement. If you're a minor, it can be two years after the occurrence, and you may be eligible for an expungement. If a plea is taken under advisement and it's dismissed, that does not count towards the expungement. In other words, it doesn't count towards the number of felonies or misdemeanors that you've been charged with. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back in a minute, and we'll go on and talk about the process of expungement. And if you're out there and listening and you don't call in, you got questions, you can still call us at the office, 248-335-9266. Thank you. trouble? Are you in need of legal advice or just have general legal questions? Call 1-800-529-8721. That's 1-800-LAW-USA-1. And watch Law Power Hour and get your questions answered by experienced attorneys who are experts in their field. That's Law Power Hour, hosted by Barry Keller, attorney at law, Saturdays at 10 a.m. here on WHPR Detroit Live. You know, oftentimes people say to me, well, I've got a conviction. I don't know if it can be set aside. I've got a list of convictions that cannot be set aside. And if you call the office, we'll send you the whole pamphlet for free. We, we don't want to charge you. We just want to give you the information so that you can see what you're up against. For example, if you commit first degree criminal sexual conduct, second degree criminal sexual conduct, or third degree criminal sexual conduct, it cannot be set aside. If you commit first or second degree child abuse, it cannot be set aside. If you operate a vehicle while intoxicated, an OUI, a DUIL, driving under the influence of drugs, cannot be set aside. If you commit a domestic violence felony, a domestic violence felony with a previous misdemeanor for domestic violence, it can't be set aside. If you're involved in human trafficking, in other words, going out and selling people for money, 
you cannot have it set aside. Fourth degree criminal sexual conduct cannot be set aside any longer. It used to be that it could be set aside. So these are examples of some of the offenses that cannot be set aside. This is important for you to know. Now, having said that, and what can't be set aside, here's the recipe for clearing your record. The cost of clearing your record, you can do it yourself without a lawyer, but you've got to follow the recipe. The first thing that you have to do is you've got to get involved in the community, and I'm going to tell you why. Because when you go to court, you want to bring some letters with you. You want to bring some letters with you from people in the community, like a church or an organization where you're participating and you're doing constructive things. This shows remorse. This shows that you're asking the community to forgive you for your misconduct. This shows that you're interested in your community and becoming a productive member of the community. So when you've got those kind of letters and you turn them in with your application to the judge, the judge says, well, look over here. This person did this, this, this. And now look at, they've turned a new leaf. And they're participating. They're doing constructive things. That helps in the process. But the first thing that you have to do is you have to spend $10 to get a copy of your criminal record. I don't care if you tell me you only have one charge. If you don't go to iChat to see if you had two charges and they dropped one, you're going to be in trouble. Because when you fill out the application for an expungement, when you fill it out, if it's not done correctly, you've got to wait another five years if it's turned down. So here's what you do. It's $10 to get a copy of your record. Then you've got to go down and you've got to get fingerprinted. After you get fingerprinted, you get a certified copy of your conviction record from the court. And then you've got an application fee with the Michigan State Police. It's $50. And then you file the petition, the application, and you'll be ready to go forward with the process. So I'm going to repeat that. ICHAT, I-C-H-A-T, online computer. If you don't own a computer, you can go to the library and do it for $10. Fingerprinted. Go down to the police department, get fingerprinted. Some agencies will do it for no charge. Others charge up to $10. A certified copy of your conviction. That means you've got to go right down to the court, whether it's a district court, Wayne County Circuit Court, 36th District Court, Frank Murphy Hall of Justice, get a certified copy of your conviction. And then the application fee for $50. If your criminal record comes back with incorrect information, because someone has stolen your identity. You get a certified copy from the court with a brief letter of explanation and send it in and ask that the errors, ask that the errors be corrected. You know, maybe your twin brother used your identity when they got arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol. Sometimes the incorrect information is in the iChat system. Wrong conviction or date because of clerical error. To correct this, get a certified copy of the judgment from the court that sentenced you. Send it to the State Police of Michigan with an explanation. Question, how do I get a certified copy of my conviction? You go down to the clerk of the court you go down to the clerk of the court where you were convicted or have one of your relatives go down and get it for you and request a certified copy of that conviction. It'll say 
either one of the two things, judgment of sentence or order of probation or a certified copy of the register of action for your case. Generally, there is a $10 fee for getting this, plus a dollar for every page that they copy. I'm going to repeat this. A judgment of sentence, order of probation, or register of action. Then you go to the local agency and get fingerprinted. You know, if you go to a lawyer, you still have to do these things yourself. It's your responsibility to bring these things to the lawyer. Good morning. Yeah, what I want to know is, uh, do you have uh, any information about veterans' law? About veterans' law? No, but if you call me on Monday, I have two or three very good qualified veterans lawyers. Uh, I'm not a veterans lawyer. I know the rules, but you have to be certified by the Veterans Administration to practice in that area. Call me on Monday at 248, write this down, 248-335-9266. One, one of our earlier guests in the show, she's phenomenal veterans lawyer and I refer all my clients and veterans cases to her. I understand the procedures. However, I'm not certified with the veterans, and at this point in my career, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I'm, my son's finishing law school right now, and he's going to be certified with the veterans next year. So I think it's very Please. important. Okay? Thank you. Thanks for calling. Now, getting back to this information, I hope you don't think I'm... Uh, redundant or I sound like an old silly man out there telling you how to do this because I want you to follow the rules. I want you to get back on your feet. I want you to have money in your pocket. I want you to have a job, get a car. I want your wildest dreams to come true and I mean it. I don't want you working under the table because if you work under the table and you get injured, you ain't going to get paid. You're going to have trouble getting paid and it's not going to count towards your social security if you're disabled. Those are another day topics that we'll talk about down the road. Now let's get back to this, it's really important. So you go down and you get a copy of the order of probation, judgment of sentence, or register of action. Ten dollars plus a dollar for each page and by God you better make sure that you get all the pages before you leave because you don't want an incomplete record. Then you get fingerprinted and then you file your application with the clerk of the court where you were convicted even though you've moved out of the city or county. Now we had one man who came to one of our expungement fairs because we put on expungement fairs and we don't charge for expungements but we only have a limited amount of resources so if you call us we'll help you with your expungement but it takes time to get done in my office because we do practice law and try and earn a living practicing law. You can call us at 248 three three five nine two six six and we'll send you a packet and tell you what to do to get the expungement now this man had a conviction up in Grand Rapids we helped him fill out his packet he went to Grand Rapids he had his case expunged he had the happiest ride back on the Greyhound that you could ever have because he was on his feet he felt better about himself and he knew he was on to a better life so that's what you have to do to get an expungement. You got to follow the rules, go through the process. So when you file the application with the court, you file it with the clerk of the court. Once you file the application, they will schedule it. They will schedule it for a hearing. The big question, how many copies? How many copies do I need to complete the application? I need one original and five copies and all have to be notarized. Certified copy of my conviction, five copies. Fingerprint card, one copy. Why do I need so many copies? Because they go to different agencies. One goes to the Michigan State Police, one goes to the court, one goes to the prosecuting attorney, 
and one goes to the Attorney General's office. That's why you need five copies. It's a nice process if you follow the recipe and get back on your feet. So far this year, we've had 27 people contact us for expungement, and 24 of them were expunged. Now, you send the copy of the application, certified record of conviction. That's what you need from the Michigan State Police. Application fee is $50 with a fingerprint card. Michigan State Police, Criminal Justice Information Center, Criminal History, Michigan Attorney General, a copy of the application, certified record of conviction. That's the second place. Prosecuting attorney, a copy of the application. You fill out a proof of service. It means that you've sent it by registered mail. Sent it by registered mail or certified mail to each one of the facilities and you fill out a form saying, I sent this on such and such a date and here's proof that I sent it to them. Go to the clerk where you first filed your application and complete the application. Make sure you keep a copy for yourself. Now, after you've done all of this, you're going to receive a notification for a hearing to set aside your conviction. Now, in order to go through the process, if you have any questions about it, you can call and ask questions and we'll answer them. We're not going to go to court all the time because it's impossible for us to cover all the courts, but we're willing to give you information on what you should be doing to complete the process. It's right on the form. Third copy goes to the Attorney General. Fourth copy, state police. Fifth copy, return. First copy is to the court, is the original. Then a copy to the prosecuting attorney. It's all covered on the application. It's all there, this whole packet here. How do I get an expungement? Can I clear my record? It's right here. It's difficult to see, but it says, can I clear my criminal record? If you want it cleared, call us at 248 335 9266 and we'll send you a packet. We are not going to answer your questions over the phone until you complete the packet. Once you complete the packet, we will answer your questions. 248 335 9266. Now let's finish talking about the barriers, the barriers to employment. So we've talked about two of the barriers to employment, getting our license back and getting our criminal record taken care of. The third barrier to employment is the friend of the court. And do you know the friend of the court? Most people think the friend of the court's a monster. And they're afraid to go down to the friend of the court because they're going to get arrested. The truth of the matter is, you're not going to get arrested if you voluntarily show up there and tell them that you want to work out a payment plan. Tell them you want to work out a payment plan to pay off your obligation, and they'll work with you. I had a man who owed $68,000. $68,000. Thousand dollars in back benefits, and he was facing imprisonment. He was afraid to go. So I told him, Look, you go down to the friend of the court, and I'll tell you what to do. He went down to the friend of the court, and guess what happened? He told them for eight years his wife had been complaining and claiming benefits. Well, their son was receiving Social Security benefits as a dependent of this man who was disabled. He was entitled to a credit. He was entitled for, to a credit for those eight years. So when he went down to the friend of the court, they took off $34,000, $34,000 of his back obligation. That's because he went down there and brought proof that his son was a dependent receiving 
Social Security benefits. And then he worked out a payment plan for the remaining balance. Well, it was important to work out the payment plan for the remaining balance because he was getting benefits on his Social Security disability and he was getting pension benefits and they were taking part of his pension and part of his Social Security to pay his back support obligation. So there's a perfect example of why you should go down to the friend of the court. The second reason you should go down to friend of the court is if you're involved in a paternity case and you're not the father and you've been charged with being a father, you've got a year to go down there and contest it. And if you don't contest it, they're going to take a judgment against you and they're going to enter an order for support and you're going to be obligated to pay for support for that child. And if it's hard dollars that are being paid by the state of Michigan through the social services agencies, you're going to be permanently responsible for repayment of those benefits. This past week, I had a man come into my office who signed an order of affiliation, and he thought he was signing an adoption paper for a child. There's quite a difference between signing an adoption paper and an order of affiliation. He got an order from the friend of the court that he owed support because he signed the affiliation order that he was the father of the child. Now, he's a pensioner. He waited all this time, didn't pay attention, and he's had all this obligation building up over the years. There's only one way that he can get that order of affiliation, which says, I'm the father of the child, removed. He's got to go to court and prove that there was fraud, F-R-A-U-D, in order to get this set aside. Consequently, it becomes a big barrier to overcome, but it's not impossible. Another friend of the court problem is, good morning. Yes, good, uh, yes, good morning. Um, I'm not trying to ask a question out of the ordinary, uh, but I'd like to ask a question. I have a case, a claim, in the city of Troy. Okay, and, uh, if, if your TV's on, shut it off, because I can't hear you. And, uh, the attorney previously that I had working on it, when I would try to get information about the status of my claim, you know, he could never fall in touch with me to let me know what's going on. Well, you want some information and about so, your case? Here's what you do. Huh? If you want some information about your case, you've got the case number? Yes. Okay. I know what I'm saying. They won't give me the information because he's held my client. And I terminated my service with them okay. yesterday because, you know, I'm not getting forthcoming information. And then my daughter calls out to the law firm and they said they have a check for her because she's been helping me since I got hurt. But, well, uh, Never Here's what you and do. My, uh, termination is coming up October 16, oh. 2008. Okay, now listen to, li listen to me carefully. Write my telephone number down. It's 248-335-9266. 248-335-9266. And we will go online and check and explain to you exactly what's occurred with your case. Okay. okay. You got my number? Okay. You want, you want me to call uh, Monday? Call Monday at 9 o'clock in the morning and ask for me or my assistant, and we will go online, 248-335-9266, and we will call okay. you back. Uh, uh, because I don't have but a couple more weeks to file a lawsuit concerning my injuries that uh, I suffered uh, on the bus. Well, we're going to check into it and explain to you what, what's going on, okay? Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. 
See, you can check. A man called me the other day, and he said to me, uh, hey, uh, my wife settled her case. I didn't settle my case. Do I still have a right to bring my case? And the statute of limitations, that's a period within which to bring the lawsuits. Three years is going to run. So I said to him, just give us the case number. We look it up. We found out exactly what was going on, and we could give him a report on it. That's what you're supposed to do. Now, I, I want to just finish this discussion a little bit about these barriers that we're dealing with. So we got the friend of the court over here. We talked about the friend of the court and how you handle the friend of the court. But here's the bottom line. You and your spouse are getting a divorce. She goes down to the friend of the court or he goes down to the friend of the court and says, well, she or he earned $60,000 a year and it's not true. The friend of the court's going to use that information to establish child support. If you don't fight it, you're going to get stuck with a huge child support obligation. So you've got to be proactive in your case. If you sit by and you're not proactive in your case, whatever case you have, you have to be proactive in your case. A poor lady called me, just another example of not being proactive. She's involved in an automobile accident. She filled out all of her no-fault forms her, herself. She filled out her wage loss forms, went to the doctor, got her paperwork for her replacement services. That means to get household help. Her mom's been helping her every day. Horrible accident. Horrible accident. And attendant care. And guess what? The insurance company isn't paying her because she contacted an attorney. He wrote a letter to the insurance company. She didn't hire the insurance company or that attorney, rather, to deal with the insurance company for that issue. Now the insurance company said, we're not going to pay you, but we're going to send a check to your attorney, and you're going to have to deal with your attorney. So you've got to be more active and proactive about what you do. Attorneys should not be contracted by individuals who do not need lawyers to handle their claims. They should only seek out attorneys. I've said this a hundred times in the air, and I'm not going to change. You should seek out to get assistance and guidance in filing your claim. You should do that from day one. Likewise, you should not go to some doctor who's a stranger to you. You should go to your family doctor who will refer you to a doctor if you need a doctor for your injury so you don't have huge bills building up. $5,000, for example, to have an MRI, which is a magnetic reasoning imaging test, when it actually cost one-third of that to have the test done. You need people to be more responsive and proactive to assist you, not to take your money, to assist you with your problems. The same thing with the friend of the court. We'll give you the recipe. You just follow it. Can I clear my criminal conviction? We'll give you the recipe. Going down to solve your outstanding tickets, if you're afraid to go and you want somebody to go with you, I've got plenty of lawyers that I can refer you to, but you're going to pay them for going. And they're going to do the same job you can do yourself, but you're going to pay all that extra money. It's all in your hands. But please, and this is my final message of the day, please be more proactive when it comes to your legal issues, whether you're taking a plea and you're unsure of the consequences of the plea, consult a lawyer and ask about the plea before you take it. Ask what the consequences are. Ask the attorney to explain to you if it will affect your right to get an expungement. Ask what your driver's responsibility issues are if you get in an accident and you're uninsured and you injure somebody it's not driver's responsibility, it's financial responsibility. Next week, we're going to have three candidates running for a judge in the Wayne County Circuit Court. We're going to have them all on at the same time. So I want you all to come in on the phone next week and ask all kinds of questions because these are candidates that are running for the bench in Wayne County, and you're going to vet them. You're going to ask them the most important questions of all. Why do you believe you should sit on that bench and rule over me, my friends, and my family? Thanks for listening to the Law Power Hour. We'll see you next week. Have a great day.